Jeremy Moore, welcome back to Sporting Dog Talk. I appreciate you for having me again, man. You you are probably between my two podcasts the most popular guest I've ever had as far as who I've chosen to come on. <laughs> oh, come on now. You're just making me <laughs> I think I think you've made more appearances than anybody else and I was uh I wanted to get you on because this is this is sort of an off time of year for a lot of trainers and not not to mean like they're not working or not to mean that you know bird dog owners aren't thinking about doing stuff with their dogs or getting new puppies but you're you're one of those guys out there who seems to find opportunities to do stuff with your dogs all the time. I see the stuff you're posting. We talk quite a bit. And you you really have built dogs into your life in a way that I, I think is really freaking cool. Yeah, I I'm I take that as a really a compliment. And that's a great way to start it. Compliment compliment me. That that's a good way to prime me up there, big fella. <laughs> but I, I do t- I take it as a compliment because it really that nails it on on it hits the nail right on the head of why and how I think um, we, we probably should use our dogs. And I think it's, a um, I think it's a lot of times over thought. There's too much thinking that goes into it with specialization. There's too much, um, we, we, we become as sports people, we become pretty obsessed with certain stuff, niche parts of our, our hunting, and we really dial in on it. And so I, I'm glad you say that because it has been an evolution for me as well as a trainer and a dog owner. And I can tell you with a hundred percent honesty that I enjoy my dogs today more than I've ever enjoyed my dogs before. I enjoy the training more than I've ever enjoyed the training before. It's for multiple reasons. And we'll probably get into a lot of them here in this talk, but um, it, that's a compliment to hear you say that because I, I, I just, I want people, I want to help other people enjoy their dogs the most they can. And, and that's, you know, obviously I, I love the topic you want to talk about because it's a, uh, it's a real important one. And I think it's not one that necessarily gets talked about a lot. Yeah. It's, I'm, I'm obsessed with it because to me, it kind of parallels my life over in the, in the big game world where, and, and you know, this, you know, people, people hit you up all the time. Like, what's the best way to kill a buck? Like, what's the best strategy for October? What's, you know, and it, it's a very hard thing to answer for the individual. I, I don't know these people. I don't know how much they put in and how much experience they have. And so I right. always kind of just lean into like, just, just learn more about the animals in the woods, like spend more time out there just leveling up incrementally. You're, you're not going to get some secret sauce that's going to make you just a badass killer. And I was, I look at that with dogs too, because the questions, and I'm sure you get these all the time are like, my dog does this, or my dog does that, or I want my dog to do this, or I want my dog to do that. How do I do this? And those are like, that. that's what we want. We want this point A to point B thing. But really, you know, there's a secret to this partially that is just spend more time working with them and spend more time doing fun stuff. And that teamwork aspect just really solidifies and you get all those different random environment opportunities to work with your dog throughout the entire year versus just thinking, how do I get this dog into a place where it's going to point these quail or flush these roosters? Yeah. You know, I think it's, so talking about big game stuff, like I've thought about, I've thought about this quite a bit actually recently, um, not for this podcast specifically, but just because of some of the stuff that has happened in the last relatively short period of time. And then maybe even the last few years. And I, I look at it this way, like I, and, and I, here's what I think people don't understand is that no matter how much we want, we, we all, I'm guilty of it. I know a lot of people that are really guilty of it. My wife is super guilty of it. Like we get into stuff in our lives and we like take it on and we become almost borderline obsessed with stuff. Like I, th- I think that personality is in a lot of us. Um, some people are not that, but, but I bet you a lot of people that are listening right now are nodding their head, just like you just did and agreeing with it because it's, we see it and, and that we've become a culture of it um, for multiple reasons, but we become so obsessed with stuff that, we get into it so deeply and, and we, and, and the reality is, is the amount of time that we have in our lives, you don't have enough time, free time to be able to get into lots of things really deep. Like, so you manage your time, you figure out how much time you have and you dedicate to certain things in life. And some people are like me are like, we really want to commit to some excellence in a certain area. So it takes, it requires a lot of focus and, and energy spent towards it and time spent towards it. What I think that people don't realize is you don't become an expert 
at anything quickly. Like no matter how bad you want it, no matter how much you want it, no matter how much time you study it, no matter how much focus you put into watching it, learning it, reading about it, listening to it, none of that is as as potent or as as it doesn't impact the results as much as actually executing on it and doing it. So like I had this conversation with my wife real recently about you have to do something a lot to get really good at it. And the the reality of that, the bottom line is that takes time. Like you can't cram more stuff in, in a short, in the amount of time that's there. So I think of deer hunting, when you bring up big game, I think of deer hunting. And this is what I was thinking about recently was if someone asked me about killing a big deer, we've, we've myself and people in our group and we've become a pretty good hunt. Like my, the group of my group of hunters that I hunt with on our, on the farm that we lease in Buffalo County, we're pretty good. I, I I'm not saying it to be a arrogant. I'm saying we've killed some really nice deer. I'm looking at one. My son killed in the one eighties. I'm looking at one. I killed one fifties. My daughter, you know, she's, she's, she was eight when she, or yeah, she was eight when she shot it. It's in the one forties. I'm looking around my room and I'm going, man, there's some really nice deer here that I look at and go, I never would have said that we, we would have a living room full of big bucks at my age right now because in the past I never killed big deer but all of a sudden we put a lot of time into it a lot of effort into it and it started to click and it started to things started to make sense and we started to do things better and then all of a sudden we're we're shooting better deer or not say better but bigger deer I'll, I'll say bigger bigger deer more consistently the bottom line is they're older deer we're shooting more older deer so yeah it's this snowball and it's this excitement and I thought about it and 10 years ago all I wanted to do and all I spent my time, money, and, and, and effort on was deer. Like I, I really committed to deer and it get, we got pretty good at it. And so now I look at it and I go, I don't think we, I don't need put nearly the time, focus, and effort into shooting big deer that I did in years past, but we still see the results. Like we're still getting the results and it's not taking as much time of mine. But the reason is, is because, and, and, and I don't even care. Like, I don't even care anymore. I used to think about it. All I want to do is shoot a big deer. Now I don't even care. I enjoy so much other parts of it than the actual shooting of the deer that I get as much enjoyment. I get more enjoyment. I'm happier with the idea of deer hunting right now and not even shooting them. And it's because I, I did all that work years ago. And it's not like I don't do that anymore. I don't put that much time into it anymore, but I don't have to because we've gotten a lot better at it. We've gotten a lot more efficient. It doesn't take as much sweat and, and work because I do things smarter and I don't have to do as much of it. And it was a it was this evolution of we developed a property over a long period of time. It took a long time for me to get to where we're at right now. But that doesn't mean that the knowledge is gone. Like I still understand how to do it. I just don't have to do it and I don't necessarily want to do it because I get as much enjoyment or more out of seeing my daughter shoot one and it doesn't it doesn't have to be Boone and Crockett. Like I enjoy her shooting a 140 more than I would enjoy shooting a 190. Yeah. So but the evolution take took place at, at, in me as a hunter. And so now I'm at a totally different spot as a hunter and I'm also at a different spot as a dog guy. And like my when I got into shed dogs like all I wanted to do was shed hunt with dogs. That was it. I focused a hundred percent of my dog training effort on it. Now I'm splitting that up. Like I, I do, I did more bird hunting in the last few years than I've done in, in the, the prior 10, but prior to that 10, I did a lot of bird hunting. Well, my bird, it's not like I'm starting over from scratch with birds. I'm just, I hadn't done it for a while. Mm -hmm. So it, it's this idea of like, just because you get past it doesn't mean you, you erase your memory of the skill. You still have it and you can apply it going forward, but we change, we evolve as hunters and as dog handlers. And, and I think it's, I think it's, um, something we should strive for. Like, I don't think if you're still have, if I still had the mindset of a deer hunter that I did 10 years ago or a dog trainer 10 years ago or 15 years ago, I'd be real disappointed in myself. Cause I'd go, how come you didn't change? You got, you, you do it long enough. You get better at it. And when you get better at it, you can change. Like, that's the idea of like, I don't have to spend as much time scouting the farm that I once did because I already did it and I understand it. And now I take it to a whole nother, I actually take it to a higher level. I take my training to a higher level with less effort. 
but none of that stuff happened quickly. Yeah. In in the listener, the listener that maybe has a couple dogs, it's really hard to achieve that in just a couple dogs over the course of 40 years. Yeah. I, I think there's, I think the root of that, which, which you didn't really touch on yet, but I know is there is it's, it's sort of easy to sit here and talk about something that you've become really good at, but the, the challenge is getting through all of the frustration and all the mistakes, Like That's, that's what I, you know, I, I have a, I have a good buddy. Actually, you know, him, Eric, uh, that we, that we hunted with, he's got his first puppy and he's calling sure. me a lot and he's struggling through the, you know, four sure. five, six month old stage right now. And it's his first time. He's never, he's never done this before. And it's a weird, it's weird for me to talk to him. Cause he'll call me up and say, Hey, the pup's doing this or the pup's doing that. And he's, he's exposed enough to sort of the professional world and the social media world side of things where he's in his head, he's kind of thinking like this, this should be happening for me. Like I should sure. be doing this step and this dog should be doing this. I'm like, buddy, everybody's, everybody who has a five month old male lab is dealing with exactly what you're dealing with. Like, yeah. you know, there's a spectrum there, but I'm like, you got to understand that this is just, this is the shitty part and it's going to take a while, but what you put in now will set the, set the precedent for the rest of that dog's life and your relationship with it. Right. But it bothered. So it's bothered the, the frustration parts. I'll put this out there. Like I have the same frustrations now that I had 10 years ago, 15 years ago. The, the do- you're right. The dogs don't change. The frustrations don't go away either. It's not that I don't become frustrated. It's not that my dogs don't make mistakes. My dogs do make mistakes. My frustrations do become a part of the equation. It's how I handle them is way different now. And it's way different than it, when, when Eric experiences it or you know Eric or anybody else, when they're experiencing those frustrations and haven't been through them a lot, it probably bothers, it's the same frustration, but it bothers them more. And it bothers them more because their comparisons are the social media stuff in a lot of perspective, uh, their buddies down the road, their guy at the gun club, the guy that they shoot archery with, that everybody has this, this, their take on it. Everybody has their input on it. And you should listen to everybody's opinions and you should listen to everybody's stuff. But you, what you don't do is you don't respond or react to it verbatim exactly what every person says or you're going left right left right like you're going in so many different directions you're never moving forward and so i have the same frustrations that eric has i had a buddy that's training a dog that i think she, he was just i think he said his dog's turning a year this this month and he comes like once a week he's he lives pretty close to me and he had been coming real regular with his dog early on and he was going through some real um typical things early on his dog was struggling to make retrieves and come back to him. And, um, and I kept telling him, focus on foundation, focus on foundation. And then we, we did that for the fall and then it got into the winter and the days got real short and we really couldn't do it very good. He couldn't come after work and stuff because it's dark out. And so he started coming a couple of weeks ago because now it's getting lighter later. And he, he showed me his dog and he did some of the things that I was telling him and recommending he do. He, he's got a really nice, dog at a 12 month old and and a nice foundation and the dog was making halfway decent retrieves and one of the things he said to me was you know one of the best things that happened was when I hit like the dog was doing great up until about five months old like it was just supernatural it brought everything back it delivered really well it got to that about four it was between four and five months old and it started to run off with stuff and started to not make retrieves and it was just he was extremely frustrated and I that's when I told him just stop just stop. Don't do it anymore. And you relax, focus on your foundation. Cause he was having a hard time healing. The dog wasn't healing very well. And he was having all sorts of stuff. And it went, so, so it went really good early on. Then it got into this middle section that was kind of a, a mess. And I kept reassuring him, don't worry about it. Just focus on your foundation, get through this, get through this, get through this. And one of the things he said to me last night when he was here was the, the most valuable thing so far that I've had with you is when things started not going good, you told me to not worry about it. I trusted you. I didn't worry about it. I did worry about what you told me to do, which was I couldn't get the dog to heal very well. I couldn't get him to be very steady. I couldn't get him to sit remotely by themselves and be calm. So I, I, I made sure that I focused on that. And then all of a sudden, it, it started to click again for him. And I said, yeah, because maturity happened. You can't speed maturity up. Mm-mm. So 
But what happened, what, what the riskiest part of that whole scenario was, is if he wasn't with me talking, talking him through this, I think at five or six months old, he'd have been so damn frustrated. He just said, what can I do? I'm at my wits end. I get these emails all the time with people that are literally like about to break. They're so frustrated. They can't handle it anymore. Like you hear my intensity start talking about because these people just go and I go, take a deep breath. And reread your email to me because you just told me all these frustrations about a six-month-old puppy. And if you don't have the patience to be able to make it through those four months without the wheels falling off of you, not the dog. I am not worried about the dogs. It's the people I'm yep. worried about. And so when we – when we like I have a dog. Like I've got one right now that um, is a little bit older, but uh, I'm going to have a puppy. I'm going to be training a puppy here pretty quickly, at least one. And – I know at about four or five months, things probably aren't are going to come off the rails a little bit. And I'm just not, I, I'm, I've done it enough nap times now where I go, well, I'm just not going to allow it to freak me out and we'll get through it. And I'll, I'll start to pick and peck at little tiny parts and pieces of it. And then I'll just kind of wait. I hate the idea of not doing anything. I, I heard a podcast the other day of a, of a trainer and I've listened to lots of them. I try to listen to as many as I can. I'm the same as what I tell people that listen to stuff I say is don't take everything word for word. Like listen to it, use what works, don't, don't use what doesn't work. So I heard this issue about a dog that had a problem. Um, it was switching. It was a problem with switching dummies. And the, the person, the trainer that was answering the question said, I just don't worry about it. Just don't worry about it. It'll fix itself. And I, I sat there and I listened and I thought, that's that's a patient approach to it. I hope I maybe it would work. I don't know that that would be my approach. My approach would be don't fix it all at once, but don't be oblivious to it and don't like turn turn away and look at and pretend it doesn't happen. I think you got to look at it and go, how come? Why is it happening? So instead of putting dummies, you know, the dog was switching on dummies that were close to each other. And so I say spread the dummies out a little bit. Make it a little easier for the dog. Don't try to fix it in one fell swoop. But at the same time, don't keep doing the same thing over and over. Because my concern is like a habit's forming. And habits that form are really hard to reverse. And so I would say let's not solve – let's not be a, a, a fix to the symptom. Let's look at what the bigger problem is and try to remedy that to avoid the symptom altogether. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't know. I just – we have the same problems. I have the same problems. I just, I just look at it and I go, I'm not going to let it derail me. So your, your buddy that you referenced who, uh, who had the wheels come off at five months, was that, was that mostly a case of him kind of getting starry eyed over the, the, the advancements the puppy was making that he thought were kind of locked in place. And so he kept moving and moving and moving, but really there, we weren't on as solid of a foundation with that dog as he thought. And so he just overdrove his headlights a little bit with it. It's probably a lot to do with it too far, too fast, you know, just taking on, taking on too much overcomplicating things because of the idea of boy, things are going so good. But, and I'm not against the idea of getting to the point where you have problems. Like you should, you should push the dog a little bit to the point of rec, but recognize where it's a little too much. And then like back up and, and again, assess the problem and go, how come, why, why am I having this problem? Maybe I should be working on something different to fix the reason that the issue I see is maybe the cause, the cause of it is something else. So I should go back and work on that and then recognize, boy, I'm really just asking too much of a young dog. Like they're just not ready for it yet. So it's okay. In fact, this is why this is, it's, it's hard to convince people of that. So I've, I've tried to like, instead of saying, slow down, slow down, slow down, no one likes to slow down. Don't, I don't try to, I try not to tell them that that way. Instead, I say, you know what you, you know what you're, you're losing out on by trying to go so fast. You're losing out on a lot of the fun. Like it's a lot of fun. Just don't be in a rush to finish the game. Like, um, golf is a good analogy that I use for this. I love playing golf. I I'm not very good at it, but I love playing it. And I love it for a lot of reasons. It's humbling. <laughs> You think you're a pretty good golfer, go golf with someone who's actually good and you'll realize real quick you're not that good. So it's a very humbling game. It's also a game that there's so much more to golf than just hitting a ball. There's 
big drive, you know, a lot, there's drives, there's fairway play, there's putting, there's all these different parts of the game that you can be the best driver in the world. And if you don't putt very well, you, you're not going to score, you know, your, your game's not going to come to you very well. So there's lots of parts of the game of golf that I like, but one of the best parts about golf, it was a light bulb moment for me years ago was a buddy of mine and I went to play a course down South and we, we played, it was in Mississippi and we played it and we, we always rented a cart. Like I always, I was always in a cart. And when we would play with my buddies, we would like, we would play. And I don't know why, but we'd always like be, be upset about, you know, the people in front of us are so slow. Can we play through? Like I felt nervous about people behind me. Cause am I going too slow? I don't want to hold them up. We got to keep moving. We got to keep moving. So it, this mindset when I played golf was always like, let's keep going. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. We got to, you know, we can't affect the people behind us. So down south we played a game of we played this round of golf and my buddy and i played the first two holes and we're like right on the guys in front of us and they are not going any faster and they are not letting us play through i mean we're just, so finally my buddy looked at me and he goes dude we're on, like we're on vacation and he looked at me and he's like where the hell do we have to go like what is the why are we rushing anyway like why do we want to get done with this so quickly so we slowed down and i played so much better and i i never thought about like the speed or the pace of the of the round of golf instead i focused probably on my shot a little bit more and i and i didn't i just didn't feel any outside pressure on it and i was like god that was the most that was the most enjoyable game round of golf i've ever played and so i've met i've ad- i told it was a life changing moment in the game of golf for me cuz i was like i'm not even going to rent a cart anymore i'm going to pull i'm not going to carry my clubs but i'm going to pull i'm going to get a pull behind cart like a pull one and i pulled the cart and i got more and then you get exercise out of it and all this stuff that's good from it the game becomes a better game for me and i actually play it better and so i've got this idea now of i don't go to a golf course to hurry up and get done i go to a golf course and i'll drag that sucker out as long as i can so when it goes to training a dog the the fun part of the dog is not the clubhouse the 19th green you know like i that'll come but like enjoy like enjoy all the holes enjoy the enjoy the take as long as you want and and all of a sudden dog training will be more fun because you're not so much looking forward to finishing it you're looking forward to like i have i get messages from people that i smile and i'm warm inside when i read them that say i'm really enjoying this i actually don't want to go as fast as it's going because I recognize how quickly this dog's growing up. You, you'll get there in the end. It's just you'll save yourself a lot of heartache and stress and frustration in the middle by just recognizing, like, just slow down and, and it's okay. Yeah, because the only other alternatives are to keep going too fast or to give up. Mm-hmm. And those are, those are undesirable. <laughs> yeah, well, and, it's, it's, and, if, and with a dog, the problem is you don't just give up. Like you can, and that's why the Humane Society is full of dogs. Like that, it, because pe- that's one way of giving up. But a lot of people, I can't give up. But they don't. They give up on their training, and then they have a, a real handful for ten years. Like they they never get out of the dog what they probably could and should, and it's a disservice to the dog. You know, like so. I I just think um, it is a mindset thing. It is a it is a a. a I hope it's a, a way I, I literally have people, some of our stuff, you know, we share a lot of stuff and some of our stuff I get feedback from and I, I appreciate feedback a lot, good and bad, because I think it's lots of ways to look to learn from it. But I've had people comment of you just you're wasting so much precious time with that puppy by going through this, this or this with it. You just need to speed this up. And I and I've messaged them back as well. And I say. If that works for you, I think you should do that. No, no, I, I have no problem with you doing it that way. I don't look at it that way. I don't look at it as I'm losing precious time. I look at it as I'm really enjoying every moment. And I, I, it's one thing that you don't see me compete. You know, I'm not. I'm a competitive person. I'm a really competitive person uh, in life in general. I'm not a competitive when it comes to dogs. I just don't. It just that's not that's not the part that excites me. So, in the end, like if you want to if you want to put a benchmark as the end, the finish line, the, the, whatever you want to you want to call it, in the end, I'd be willing to bet that 
my slow tortoise pace, we get to that line. And when we get there, I, I, I'm very confident with the end product. Like my, whether it be my client's dogs or one of my personal dogs, um, I have, I have a real high set level of satisfaction with every dog I work with. And, and, and I, and I mean that like everyone it's, it's, um, they're all, they're all different, but when we get done with them, they're really nice dogs. And I, and I don't know that anyone would have a real strong argument against it with me. Yeah. Do you think you said something way earlier and I I wanted to comment and I totally forgot, but it, what it, what it made me re it, what it reminded me of, there's two things here. The, the pacing thing, I think you just learn that if you do enough challenging stuff over time, because I'm, you know, you've met me, you've hunted with me, like I, I can get into the cover of the ground mode real easy. Yeah. And especially yeah. hunting with Luna the last few years, I've really hit the brakes and just to let her work and not be yeah. on that breakneck pace, even, even a lot of it was just going solo and just being yeah. like, I don't, like you said, like I walk into this cattail sloop, I don't have anywhere else to be. I don't need to burn through it to get to the next spot, you know? And it really opens your eyes up to all the birds you're missing before. But For it sure. also, what I, what I've realized and it about dogs is like, we, we place this idea on them, like we're going to go do these double blinds or these whatever retrieves today, or we're working on this stuff, or we're going to get this limit of roosters or whatever. But you you end up when you get a really good relationship with a dog going, okay, I know this dog has this hole in its game a little bit. I know right when we get out there, it's going to be burning all over and I just need to, I, I need to let it get it out of its system and then we can work together or in training sometimes like have that fun bumper for a little while or the new environment or just let it get in the water and sniff around before you start. And I wonder sometimes, especially if you get these dogs that are five, six, seven months old, if people are getting out there and they're going straight into, you know, we, we go out, we're going to do the work, we're going to get this lesson done, we're going to go back and they're not letting it develop that way as well hundred percent cultural. It's, it's a lifestyle. It's, it's the way, it's the way we operate is, is our dogs mirror it. And so I, like I, the, the guy, it's really interesting. Cause last night, and I didn't even think about this until just now, but last night when my buddy and his wife came over with their dog, uh, now he's 12 months old. So he's a little bit younger. I've got one right now. That's uh 15, 16 months old that I'm working with. And I had her out there with me because I wanted that dog, their dog to work around another dog. Cause he doesn't get that chance very often. So, and I thought, well, this is a good opportunity for me to get a little training in with this dog. Um, so I, I'm double dipping. I'm being real efficient. I'm getting work with my dog and his dog and we're, everybody's benefiting from it. So when, when they came, their dog was very excited, really excited. Now a new environment, another dog that he's not, that he's not used to, um, you know, we're, we're here I look at it and I go, well, this dog that's here is comfortable environment has been here. Um, you know, uh, totally comfortable around other dogs. Cause I work here with my dogs all the time. So a little bit different, a little bit further advanced, you know, like she's a little bit further advanced. She's older too. And so she's more mature. And, but I, I think those are all factors, but I think the biggest thing about it is that we don't, I think when my buddy brought the dog over, the dog knew it was a training session because when the leash comes out, when the training bag comes out, when all that stuff happens, we have a training session and my buddy listens to what I tell him. And I say to him, don't overwork the dog short, nice, short sessions, successful sessions to build off of. So they do that. And when that happens, it's a very fun thing for the dog. Dog enjoys working. I like dogs to want to work. I don't want to look at it like they dread this. It should be, should be positive. So the dog comes out and is ready to go, 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 go. And for about a 15, 20 minute session, you could get real nice productivity out of that dog. You could get some focus. You could, you could work on some stuff, but the problem is, is there's no 15, 20 minutes of calmness before the 15, 20 minutes of productivity. And then another 15, 20 minutes of kind of ramping back down before we put the dog up. That's not their routine. Their routine is I've got, and he's a construction guy. Um, so It's a very, it's a very, it's an inherent thing in most guys that are anyone in that type of industry that productivity is real important. I used to, that used to be my life. So I had to really change my mindset when it came to dogs. But so he comes out and he's going to get his 15 minute session in and he's been doing it and getting nice results, but he's got a dog that's a little bit energetic. 
it's a British dog. Oh my God, British dogs can't be energetic, right? No, they can be. They certainly can be. American dogs can be calm. British dogs can be excited. It has partially has to do with what's in them. It has a lot to do with their culture around them. So one of the things that his dog struggled with last night, and one of the things that I saw my dog just excel at, it wasn't, it's a dog I'm training for a client, but the thing that excelled at, and she noted it, the wife noted it was, look at how calm she is compared to Finley and their dog's name is Finley. And I said, yeah, but, and I mean, they're both cut from the same cloth. They're both genetically very close. And I said, it's because he's never been asked to go work. First off, when they got here, we talked about maple syrup because they make maple syrup and I make maple syrup. So we sat in the driveway and talked for 15 minutes about sapping season and his dog couldn't sit still. His dog just got up. I mean, he had to reset the dog, reset the dog, reset the dog. I walked up off lead with the dog and told the dog to sit and the dog just sit there. And so he got out of the truck and expected to go work. He had a really hard time with that first 15 minutes. Finally, I said, well, let's get to, let's get to doing a little bit of work. Let's go up to the porch. We're going to make some retrieves on the porch. So we went up to the porch and his dog did very well, did a really nice job. Then when we got done, I said, now, and, and he kind of got done with the last retrieve and he kind of just let the dog go. Let the dog kind of wanted to just run around and, and wander around a bit. And my dog's just sitting there the whole time. And I said, no, 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 no. We're not done yet. And he goes, oh, I thought you said we were going to be done. I said, yeah, we're done with that retrieve and we're going to be done retrieving, but we're not done with training. Bring that dog back and get him to sit. So he calls the dog back and he get, tells the dog to sit. Well, the dog thought he was done. The dog decided, I'm going to go do my own thing. I said, you, we're never going to end a session with let the dog have freedom. And all the stuff we just worked on just goes out the window if we don't allow it to s- settle. So put that dog on, sit, and have him sit because now I'm going to make I'm going to show you what I'm doing with Callie. And I was working on some hand signal stuff with her. So I took her and I wanted to show him. She's making this mistake. She's got a problem with it. She's having a hard time with this. So I think it's this. And I explained to him what we were going to do. I started to do it in my yard. I started to show him how I was going to do it. And for the first two or three minutes, the first dummy I threw, his dog wanted to break. Good thing he had it on lead. So, so that we start, we do five, six of these handling drills. And then I bring, then I put my dog on sit and I went back over to talk to them. It took me 15 minutes to do that. About five or six minutes into it, his dog started to settle down a little bit. For about the last 10 minutes, he sat there pretty nice. So then we get done and I called Callie over and I had him sit next to each other. And we started talking again and explaining. And the, so the takeaway for it, I hope was, he looked at that and said, we had a 45, it ended up being an hour total. We had an hour long session. That 15 minutes of it was concentrated on things that we were working on with his dog. The other 45 minutes of it were concentrating on his dog being okay with not doing a bunch of exciting stuff. That to me is the the whole hour was really beneficial to the dog. I don't know that I would pick any of those 15 minute increments and say this was more or less important because quite honestly, he's doing pretty well with the retrieving. I don't know that he gained a lot from that. He just showed me what he's got. The part that he gained was the first 15 minutes when he wanted to get antsy. And when we're talking maple syrup, he wasn't allowed to do what he wanted to do. And after the 15 minutes of training, he wasn't allowed to run around and waste, let that all kind of dissipate. So I think the, probably the 15 minutes before and after the, the middle there where he retrieved might've been the most important part of that session. Now you can't do that with a 10 week old puppy because an hour is too long, but you could take that hour long session and you could kind of break it down into three or four minute increments instead of 15. Mm -hmm. And I think the effects of it early on are an understood behavior of everything isn't always go, go, go. So back to your point of the idea of the, the mentality of for the first 15 minutes of the hunt, we let them burn off their energy. I think it's a very dangerous and frustrating habit to have with a dog and absolutely not desirable. So it's programmed, unfortunately, it's programmed into them from the early on because we go, well, let's just burn off a little energy so they can focus. Instead, I say, let's let them understand that they have to focus to start out and have to resist the urge and temptation to be a free runner and burn energy. Challenge them. That's a mental challenge for the dog. But I th- you can do it. Do, do you think that that's tied? So this was probably a total crackpot theory, but I've... 
I've talked about this a few times on here where I've watched uh, coyotes put on like deer drives. I've sat, especially hunting out West, you, you get to observe this more. And it's amazing when you see, you know, if you're out in Buffalo County and you see a coyote go by, it's probably cruising along, sniffing stuff, working a, you know, fence line or something like you, you see them, they seem like they're always on the move. But then if sure. you get to watch them out West where you can see them, you know, maybe like in a mountain basin or something, you really, you get to observe like a long, sometimes it's hours. And I've seen a couple of these where it's like they, they have drivers and standers and you watch these. And I've, I've seen young ones do this where it's like, they're just posted up at a vantage point, watching the whole thing play out. Sure. And I always wonder like how, and I know this is a huge stress from that to a domestic dog that we're working with in our backyard, but I always wonder if they're more genetically predisposed to watching and learning than we think. I think pa- patience, the word patience is something that nature has mastered. Like that coyote doesn't have a dead, doesn't have a time where he's got to be anywhere. Like he's got to survive. Right. And part of that patience is a survival method. Like that's a, that's a tactic of surviving. You gotta get good at that. We, we're the ones who I think a lot of times create these dogs to be a little bit more wound tight than they probably are inherently. And it's because it's because they, they fall in. I think they fall into our routines. They fall into our lifestyles. I challenge anybody that struggles with a dog that is just too high, strong, just too, too hyper two bouncing off the walls. I challenge any one of you that are listening that have that dog to really be critical of, and don't just blind eye it. Look at your routines, look at your schedules, look at your habits, look at how you operate in life and ask yourself if you were an observer, would you, and then, and then think of a person that you think of as man, are they, just relaxed like boy they are borderline lazy like that's i think we would call them some people that go at a slower pace we think they're lazy find think of someone that's like that that you know because we all know some people like that and go compare my pace to their pace and if you're an observer watching that am i a little bit high would you classify me as a little bit high strung a little bit little little bouncing off the walls a little bit a little bit here there everywhere because i'm guilty of it I, I run at a frantic pace because in some of my stuff, I take too much on. I have too many balls going right now and I'm juggling and I'm trying to keep up and there's I'm, I'm all sorts of directions, whether it be family, business, friends, all sorts of stuff going on. We just, we, we, I, I'm okay with admitting it. Like I'm, I'm definitely trying to get better at it. But when you look at what I, even what I do with the dogs, I still think I've got too much going. Like I still am a little too fast with stuff. It's a reminder watching YouTube, watching myself on YouTube. I don't watch, I don't watch very many episodes, but I will watch a few because someone will ask a question. I'll have to go back and refer to it. I I usually just have the guys record it, edit it, post it. We've got a great team and I'm super comfortable with how they, I don't have to watch their stuff anymore. Like I did early on and now we've got the kinks worked out. And so we just record and put it out, record and put it out. But occasionally I'll watch it and it's good for me to watch it at times because I'll realize, boy, slow down. Like I'll tell it to myself. And I have a lot of people say, you're just so, you're just so patient with them. I can tell you, I can pick out a million spots where I should be more patient. I need to slow down. I need to be quiet. The video, the camera gets in the way of a lot of that because I do feel like this pressure to be entertaining and move faster and, uh, you know, explain what's going on and, it's not the best scenario for training a dog is to do it on camera, but we do the best we can with it. And, but I, I can tell you that I need to slow down at times and I'm probably slower than most. So I, I don't know that we can, I don't know that we can say it enough and I don't know that we can act on it enough to say we have to be more patient. And that goes back to that nature thing. Like deer are the reminder of they remind me of it every year when i bow hunt when i have my first sit of the season it's a reminder every year it jumps into my head of i just can't get over how patient these animals are like the way they walk through the woods and it takes them forever to get through 
They stop, they'll wait, they twitch their ears, they're smelling, they're listening, they lay down, they stand up. They they never do anything quick until they're spooked. But when they're in their when they're in their natural element, they're really patient. But why not? Yeah. They they don't have any reason not to be. Um, I want to ask you about something. So you posted uh you posted some pictures. I don't know, probably a couple months ago now, maybe. Uh, it looked like you were probably in Wisconsin hunting snowshoe hares, and you had your yep. your lab sitting there posing with these these white hairs in their mouth. Uh, yep. did, did, how much shit did you get for that? Uh, well, a lot of people say, well, you can't hunt snowshoes with no snow on the ground. I said, the hell I can't. <laughs> uh, I, 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 so I got, I heard about that. Um, well, and it, we should, we should clarify that because there's no snowshoe season in Wisconsin, right? It's year round, right? Year round. You yep. can hunt them. Yeah. You can hunt them. Year- yeah. I think people were saying from a challenge standpoint yeah. and they're right. It, it was much easier, obviously to hunt a snowshoe rabbit with no snow on the ground. The, the thing is, is we, when we, on that hunt in particular, we were grouse hunting. Like we we're, we were, we weren't targeting rabbits, but we were in cover that, um, was full of them. And this year was a great year for snowshoes. I ended up I ended up hunting over beagles um, several weekends and brought my dogs. So that weekend, that picture that I had with the dogs holding the, the rabbits, we were actually grouse hunting and got into this cover full of them. And a buddy that was with us had never shot one before. And so he just thought it was fantastic. He thought it was just a blast. Um, what we did, what we ended up doing is hunting them, quartering the dogs, just like we would for birds. And when we saw the rabbits... I whistled the dogs to stop. So my dogs don't, my dogs don't chase. Um, I have one that will, um, if we let her, uh, I, I, she certainly will be tempted to chase a rabbit, but for the most part, my dogs are going to not chase a rabbit. And, and it comes from, uh, you know, I'm knowing them off of them pretty early on. Um, it comes back to foundation when they, when they get on one and are running it, I'm stopping them on a whistle. Um, and, and that comes through training when in the yard with birds and all sorts of stuff where we're stopping dogs to tempting things. I stop dogs to things I want them to be after like a, a, a pheasant on the ground that runs off. I don't want them chasing it. So I, unless I want them to, so I want to be able to say, Nope, stop. I want to be able to focus and make a retrieve on a dummy in a pen full of birds. So that's a training thing that we go through, but with those and on that particular hunt, we would, we would kick these bunnies out and then I'd stop the dog. And then we go, okay, because we don't normally shoot, we don't shoot rabbits. Um, we don't shoot anything on the ground when we're bird hunting. Like it's for safety. So this hunt, we said, okay, when these rabbits go, I'll stop the dog to the whistle. The, and the rabbits don't, like, if you watch a rabbit run through the woods, they run like hell. And then all of a sudden they hold, they stop. And they think, I think they think they're hidden and we can't see them. When they're white and in the brown, I can see them. So we would do that. We would stop. We would move up without the dogs jump the bunny out whatever it was spook the bunny out shoot it and then i my buddies would do that and then i would send the dogs out to make the pick pick the pick the rabbit and bring it back um totally different style than when we hunted them over the beagles and i i I posted some pictures of that too and maybe actually you might be even referring to that one because we we did it where we ran a group of of beagles on them and i took my dogs and i just healed them with I, that do- those dogs I did not that time I did same dogs but that time I did not quarter the dogs grouse season was closed um, we were just targeting rabbits there was a foot of snow 18 inches of snow on the ground and all I did was heal them and so the rabbits we the the dogs we were with they did not retrieve they didn't pick rabbit they didn't want anything to do with the rabbit once the rabbit was shot um, and so what we would do there is run the run the um, the beagles we'd get on a get on a track. We'd hear it. We'd position ourselves where we thought the rabbit would loop back to, and we'd wait. And I had two. I hunted two dogs with me that day. Uh, had them on heel, uh, off lead, of course, because you're not, you're not, you're certainly not healing a dog through any of that cover with with a lead. So off lead on heel in position, and then we'd sit and wait. And then the, you know, my buddy's watching his GPS collar, and he's seeing where the dogs are, and you can certainly hear them coming. And then all of a sudden, we'd shoot one. And those dogs, those dogs are just on to the next. They just wanted to go hunt another one. And so then I would line the dog, send the dog, let the dog retrieve the rabbit, bring it back to me, and on we'd go. It was, it was super enjoyable. I absolutely love 
loved every minute of it. So, but you weren't worried at all about you know that level of exposure with your your bird dogs to rabbits. You're you're not worried at all about them starting to think maybe this is the thing I should be out here chasing. No, because I I they have an understanding of when we well in this in the in the case where we were hunting over beagles, it was such a different. I mean, it was like it was like a gun dog uh, versus an you know an up. It was more of a gun dog setup. Had a dog on heel, was patient and watching. The action was taking place instead of birds working a decoy. Uh, it was a rabbit being chased by a beagle. We shoot, and then everything's you know we're calm. Everything everything's settled back down. I know we've got one. Okay, now I'm going to send the dog. Now I want the dog marking. If the dog can see it, I mean, it's pretty thick, so it's hard. Most of them end up being essentially a blind retrieve because they're not really, it's not open country. Yep. So we're lining, but they can hear the dogs. They hear the beagles coming through. They see the shot. They understand a general direction. I line the dog into the direction and I send it and I push it and it pushes out. And, um, you know, if you got to handle them a little bit, you handle them a little bit, but I'm not big on, not big on overhandling my dogs. I'm not, I, I like to get them in an area and let them hunt. So I'm going to push them into that area and then let them hunt and just let them, let them do what they do. Uh, no, I'm not in, in the more tempting situation would have been when we were grouse hunting, you know, when we're quartering and casting and they come up on a rabbit and that rabbit's sitting tight and they bump it, they jump it for the first time, they're nose to nose with them a lot of times. And so the, the concern is at that point, will that dog chase the rabbit? Well, if I let it, it would, but I, I stop it on a whistle and say, no, 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 no sit and then we watch the rabbit where it goes and then we make a plan on if we're going to go try to hunt that rabbit and we we let we actually let we shot five i think uh we let 10 go like we didn't shoot we didn't shoot everyone we saw good lesson for the dog to understand that you know they're not going to shoot everything i'm not going to retrieve everything that i jumped but the idea of if they did chase at that point the thing to me would be well i got to work on some foundational work here i got to get i got to get control of that dog have to get them to be able to stop to the whistle in distracting situations. I have to have them understand that I say no to something. That means you don't go get it. Uh, I say, go get it. That means go get it. So they have to understand that the difference of the two, um, the best running dog in the world does me no good if I can't stop it when I don't want it to. So it's a hundred, it's a, it a hundred percent goes back to their foundation. So do I have concern with it? If I did have concern with it, I'm probably putting them in a position to fail. And I, I need to kind of shore that stuff back up. Mm -hmm. I just, I, I'm always curious about that. My last dog, I had, I would, I take her rabbit hunting all the time and she'd go retrieve them and I'd never, sure. you know, snowshoes and cottontails and it yeah. never, I, I, you know, people, people would ask me about it. I'm like, I don't know. And it, this has never felt like it's taken anything away from her. And she was very easy to stop and send. And so in that situation, if I was out with her and I, we bumped up a rabbit, I'd just do the same thing that you were talking about, get her to sit. And it, what, it was awesome for two reasons. It was just another, another chance to hunt with her, which was fun, sure. but it taught me, you know, I grew up rabbit hunting, not with dogs, just jumping on brush yeah. piles with my buddies. And I didn't realize how many freaking rabbits we were hitting that would cover another 15, 20 yards and get into a brush pile or something. 100%. And you yeah, you know, you go, oh, we missed it because there you you can scare a rabbit to death, and you think, yep. okay, well, it ran through, and I I sent a load of seven and a half its way, and it didn't roll over, so I didn't get it, and then you send that dog out just in case, and you realize, right. man, you hit a lot more than you think. Absolutely, yeah, it's a game. I mean, that that's just the idea of um, you know conservation. It, they're a conservation tool, the dog in, in general, and I I think you know we don't. And the thing about it is like th that hunt that we took those pictures um, of when it was no snow on the ground, we weren't targeting snowshoes. We were, we were targeting grouse. Late, it was late season and we were, that's what we were hunting. And normally we don't shoot rabbits. I don't shoot rabbits hardly ever when we're grouse hunting because I don't want to carry them. We're putting a lot of miles on and I don't love them that much that, I, that you know, I like, I, we had some great meals with these rabbits. Like I, I actually we'll probably shoot more of them in the future because we, we cooked some up and it was just really good. Uh, reminded me of how much I enjoyed it and like it, but I don't, when I'm grouse hunting, I'm, I'm grouse hunting and I, I'm not, I'm not necessarily looking to shoot rabbits. We, we jump a bunch of them. And like I said, from a safety standpoint, we don't hardly ever shoot them on the ground. We don't shoot anything on the ground. I, I just, 
I'm not saying guys can't do it. I'm saying I don't want them doing it by my dogs. Um, if I'm by myself, I would be more comfortable doing it. I don't want to put someone in a bad position. Um, I don't want to have, like I brought my nephew. Um, he's 13. I, I don't, I, I've just, we got a rule. You just don't, sh Jake, you don't shoot stuff on the ground. And he has no problem with it. And so, but when we, you know, when I actually went rabbit hunting with those beagles, you got to shoot them on the ground. And that's part of the game. I've now, I don't have my dogs out quartering and casting at that point. And we just flipped this, this, the scenario, this, the, the training we've trained for that. Like, like I said, it's kind of like, uh, it's a lot more like duck hunting, you know, from a sense of the dog sits next to you, quiet and calm watches, sees the action take place. And then you decide what you want them to do. So it goes back to the idea of, boy, you, the whole thing when you started talking about this was, man, you can enjoy the dogs a lot more. Well, hell yeah, I can enjoy the lab. The Labrador can be used and enjoyed just as much on a rabbit hunt with beagles as they can a mallard hunt out of a pit blind. For me, that, that to me, that's a big value. Yeah, me too. Um, on that note, I want to ask you something. So I've, I've got this new pupster coming uh, the end of May, and I, I want to train it uh, – to you know be a game recovery dog you know i've got my little girls out hunting deer and i hunt deer and i know a lot of people who hunt deer and there's many times where i'm like i uh, i wouldn't i wouldn't hate having a dog around I, so i'm 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 probably most excited about this pup for that because i've never done it before and i was thinking about this this morning and bef i want i want to get into that a little bit but before we get into that do you think you know, with your experience, uh, you, you've trained a lot of game recovery dogs, uh, a lot more than most trainers that I know anyway. And do you think that, uh, you're at any disadvantage if I take a, if I take a lab out to do this task, that's going to be a, a multi-purpose dog versus, you know, if you see the, the real, a lot of the real hardcore tracking dog folks, they've got the German breeds. Do you think you're at like a, an appreciable difference there? I personally don't. Now, I think it depends on this. This kind of goes back to the idea of when we were talking about like the degree you get into stuff. Like the guys that go out and buy specialized breeds for tracking, they're trackers. They're not weekend. They're not a guy that's you know going to track three or four times. Most are not going to be a guy that tracks three or four times a year for their family and friends. I'm I am completely in that group. Like I'm not. I'm not a tracker. Like I don't go and do tracking services. I think when we first came out with our training products, it, it rubbed some tracking guys wrong because they went, you are the problem that we're going to have because now everyone's going to be a tracker. And I think there were a lot of different reasons for it. I think some people felt a little threatened by it. I think people thought, really enjoyed that kind of elite status of you're, you have a tracking dog, like you're known for that. And I get it, man. Like they put a, they put a ton of time and effort. They put as much time and effort into that as I did back in the day when I was 100% committed to trying to kill a big deer. Like it's a complete commitment. And I love that. What, what they didn't understand when we first came out with our products were I'm not looking to motivate or inspire someone to become a tracking service and charge and take your potential clients or, give trackers a bad name. I, my idea was I am not going to, it's not likely that I'm going to call one of those very few people that are out there that do that and pay them probably what it's going to cost to come and track the dough that my dad shot on Sunday night. And we got to go to work on Monday morning. Like, and I don't think that's right to not have a better chance to find that dough. I think we should do everything we can to find her. I know for a fact that an untrained dog, a dog that's never tracked before, because I have buddies, I have a buddy in college that told me this story a long time ago when I was in college. And he said, you know, my dog, my buddy had a golden retriever. This is my buddy's buddy, had a golden retriever. And they had shot a deer that they couldn't find. And they were from up near Mercer. They were up, up north, northern Wisconsin. And he said, and that dog was a bird dog. And they couldn't find this deer. I can't, I thought it was a doe, but man, now I'm thinking about it. I think it might've been a nice buck actually. And so it was like, they were a little desperate. And so they couldn't find it, couldn't find it, couldn't find it. And he was pretty sure it was dead. He pretty sure he had a good hit on it. I think it actually rained. So I don't think it was like a bad hit. I think it was rained and they couldn't find it because they couldn't see any blood and they couldn't find it, couldn't find it, couldn't find it. 
and the guy took his golden retriever out there, not with the idea of looking, for, not not the idea of I'm going to use it as a tracking dog. He just took it with because they were going to go look, and he brought his dog with, and the dog tracked it and found the deer for him. And I'm like, and he told so he told me that story, and that was in my head for a long, long, many, many years. And so I look at it this way: I think a dog with even marginal training has a much better chance of finding deer than not lo- not looking for them at all or me looking for them by myself. So the idea of training one, you don't, ha- the specialized breeds, that's for, that's like, that's like, for, that's like, uh, you know, I like shooting a little bit of clays. Like I, I like shooting sporting clays, but I'm not going to go buy a $50,000 sporting clay gun where guys who are really into sporting clays, you now they might, they might start out with the same, you know, inexpensive gun that I have, but then they might go to a $5,000 gun and then a 10 and then maybe a 25 and then a 30 and they might end up at a 50 or plus they, but they're really into sporting clays. They can justify it where I look at it and go, I don't think you have to be a professional tracker in order to use a dog to find a wounded deer. So to me, the idea is appeal to the masses, appeal to the me's of the world and give me a better chance at finding a deer. And I think that sporting, the, the sporting breeds, the retrieving breeds especially, um, are just like they're almost pre-wired for it. Most dogs are. Some dogs are more so. The super hardcore tracking dogs, you know, I'm not going to take those dogs and grouse hunt with those dogs. I'm not going to take those dogs and do my uh, do all the stuff that I want to do with them. But I, and I'm not saying they can't. It's just it's a lot more challenging for them to do it. And so they're 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 really niche built to do something. So those that makes sense that they do that. For you or I, you're getting a lab, right? Yep. So you're gonna have a lab. So I look at it and I go, well, that's why I rabbit. Like like someone can make that argument to me and say, well, you shouldn't be rabbit hunting with those dogs. Well, why not? You know. I, it worked. It, it, and so are they the best rabbit hunting dogs in the world? No, but did they help me make it a more enjoyable experience? For sure. Did they help with results? Yes, because that rabbit that got one pellet in it that crawled and buried himself into a brush pile that I wouldn't have found if the dog hadn't been there to track it in and pick it up and bring it back. There, it's it's paid, it's justified. Yeah, Matt, I- that makes me so excited. I, I'm I'm pumped to train the new pup in a lot of different ways, but I'm excited to go down that path just because of living in the deer world for so long. Yeah. And just, I, I have such limited experience with it. You know, I called in a guy last year when my daughter hit a deer uh, opening night over in Wisconsin that he brought some draughts over and gave it one hell of a go. And it just... I, I'm, that that has me really pumped. That's that's one thing I want. I've I've wanted to build in for a long time. You know, I've done the shed dog thing and stuff like that, but I've never done that, and I think it's going to be really cool. Sure, it'll help you. I think it'll help you because you're going to bird hunt with it too, right? Oh you yeah. Do other stuff. This isn't this isn't the sole purpose that you're buying that dog. So it I I can tell you right now, it will make your dog a better hunter. Like it, it the more we hunt, the better they are hunters. The 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 need for that. To be the need for my kid to be the best basketball player is non-existent because genetically he's not going to, my kids are not going to be six foot six or taller and they're not going to go to college and play basketball. They're not going to play professional basketball, but they're going to enjoy, they, they like the game, but they also like playing soccer and they also like playing baseball. And the idea of playing all those sports, I guarantee you in the big picture, they're better athletes because of it. They're probably better people in the big picture because they learn a lot of concepts about teamwork. They learn a lot of concepts about commitment. They learn they learn all these other things that are just extra bonus pluses that they take away from playing lots of sports. So dogs that hunt, I think they become better hunters. They become a better athlete, more well-rounded. Well, yeah. I mean, if you look at, you know, I, I've always, I, I preach that all the time on here. And this is one of the reasons I try to get people to go hunt new states and go go down to nebraska and hunt public land or kansas or somewhere like get your dog in new new situations with new birds it's a freaking yeah. blast and you see them you know you you can watch them learn on those initial trips and see them dealing with new environments and it's it's such a good thing for them and look at what it does for the people like i wouldn't go to kansas or wherever name a state nebraska kansas iowa or south i'm not making that trip for myself to go watch to go try to hunt some pheasants or some quail or some anything. I'm not going through the brush 
that we go through in northern Wisconsin for grouse just to shoot a grouse. Like, yes, they're delicious. Yes, they're beautiful. Do I think they're really cool birds? For sure. But I'm not putting myself through that just because I really like the bird. If I didn't have a dog, I wouldn't be going. And so if I didn't have a dog and I didn't go, I wouldn't put my seven or eight miles on in a day. I wouldn't put my 15, 20,000 steps on. Like the benefit for me grouse hunting is I lost a bunch of weight in the month of October. Now I gained it back deer hunting in November, but uh, it it's it's I feel healthier doing it. We shed hunted this spring just a couple weeks ago, a week ago. And I took a dog that doesn't shed hunt with. It, she's not going to be a shed dog. She's going to be a, a bird, she's an upland dog. I took her with. She she put on all the miles that the shed dogs did. We picked up. We had one really nice day. We had we picked up twenty six sheds in one day on our farm. It was fantastic. And I I can we're going to have a cool video on it. It was it was awesome. It's a great hunt. But what was so this dog's going to be an upland dog. And one of the things I'm working with on her is getting her out, getting her a little more range. She has a hard time getting out. Uh, she wasn't trained as a flushing dog for the first 12 months of her life. She got started with another kennel. Great. They did a great job with her, but she had a, she might, the client that I'm training her for wants to upland hunt with her. So I got to get this dog to get out. And I was really struggling with it. We're doing a series on YouTube with it right now. I mean, I was struggling hard. I couldn't get the dog to get, get off my heels. It was right on my hip. It was a great little pocket dog. It would have been a great little rabbit dog. It was just, but I couldn't get her to go out and flush. And so we worked on a lot of different things. I went through, we're writing an article for Gundog. We're writing a series of articles for Gundog Magazine documenting this process. I've run into some walls. I've, I've hit some dead ends. We've made some changes to our training and we're getting some success out of it. But this shed trip was the mo maybe the most, one of the more beneficial things out of the shed trip was I took her with the entire time. We went to Iowa for two days and then we hunted our farm for two days. And if, so I'm shed hunting. And I'm getting the idea of finding the antlers. And we had this great day. And I took some nice pictures with antlers and all that stuff. But you know what that little dog did? We counted six different drumming grouse on the farm. Each bluff had two drumming grouse, one on each end. And those drum, and so I know there's hens there because I've got drummers on the logs. So we worked our way through the farm, through the valleys, on the bridges, on the bluffs. And we bumped these drumming grouse out of cover. We found them in prickly ash, which was not near the pot. We have some popple regeneration on the farm. So we have a real diverse uh, cover across the, the farm, which is habitat, beautiful habitat for the grouse. But I went through the covers that I thought the grouse would be in, and I found better deer sign than I've ever found. So we're going to hang some stands on the edges of these popple thickets because 100% a buck brings a doe in there and spends a lot of frustrated time waiting for her to be bred. So I could see it. I've never counted so many rubs in a in a three or four acre thicket so we go wow we gotta get a stand on each end of this so that you could hunt it during the rut so we we took that away from a shed hunt a shed hunt found us sheds but we also found some really good spots where i think we need to hang a few stands for next fall during the month of november we also re i also realized these birds related to this prickly ash which is like another regeneration thing it's on the field edges it's thick as shit you can't hardly walk through it it hurts it's bleeding and all but that's where we found those birds in the spring and so now i'm not going to hunt them in the spring but you know what i want to do is i want to find these drumming logs because i'd like to sit and i'd like to watch them on a drumming log so we're going to pop up a blind next to this spot and i'm i we found some sheds in these points on these bluffs that are in prickly ash where these deer were bedded in next to the feed which we don't normally i have no reason to walk through prickly ash it's it's not fun but we're finding these birds in there and this little quartering dog of mine developed really nice range on this trip because we went through cover that was very good shed cover for my shed dogs but it was good grouse cover and my dog developed this range of starting to understand get away from me and have a little confidence be okay with the idea of hunting around now she went she came right across some sheds and never picked a single one up because she doesn't have any clue that there's value to them so my other dogs would pick this thing up and they'd get all excited and she'd see that and go, wow, look at the praise he's giving these dogs for picking up that thing. But she had zero interest in it because she never associated it with anything she's ever picked up. But she got birdie. She'd get her nose in there and she'd get sent where that grouse was. She'd get So I'm going, I'm shed hunting and enjoying that. But you know what? Callie's becoming an upland dog because I'm shed hunting and taking her with. 
my other dogs are getting experience to pick up more antlers and that it's clicking with them for the first day they walked over sheds because they haven't picked sheds up for almost over a year and so all of a sudden it started to click light bulb came on you saw them go oh we're doing this and all of a sudden now they're picking up the antler instead of hunting the grouse that they thought we were maybe doing because that's what we did last time so again we started this out with the idea of a specialized breed for tracking and i go if you're going to be a tracking service that might be the fit if you're going to go on 100 to 300 tracks a year if you're going to spend the three month window taking calls and, and, and tracking, you might want that, that specialized $50,000 trap gun. You might want that specialized dog. But if you're going to do what I do, hunt them in the fall, hunt them in the spring, work them in the, you know, do, do, I'm doing stuff, go, go to the kids' soccer games, do all the stuff with them and enjoy them through all of that. I like, I like that versatility to be able to do it with, with the style of dog I have. Um. Before we wrap this up, back me up a second here. So you take this pocket dog out on a on a shed hunt, and it's just along yep. for the ride. It's just it's running through the woods with you, and you you had previously had trouble getting this dog to range out, and you yep. get into this really interesting cover, and there's a lot of grouse, and there's a lot of cool things to smell and see and flush and hear, and this dog just starts to get confidence and get curious, and it starts to move out. Well, it was we had I I had had her for about six weeks prior and so leading up to this trip we ra- i i tried to range her like i do normally i tried to take her out and just let her quarter and cast i thought she's gonna do it she's labrador she's gonna do it and i put some birds out and i just i couldn't get her to get away from me she won she didn't have the confidence to get away so through some of our training we tried to get her to do it and couldn't do it then i took a break <laughs> i literally took a break we had two weeks of sub-zero temperatures which didn't allow me to go out with her. So nature forced me to take a break. I just said, we're not going to go out in this. I can't, I'm not comfortable in it. She's not comfortable. In it. We're not going to try to film in it. So we'd stopped. And I started during that window is when I thought about it. And I went, well, let's see what she does really well. She heals really well. She retrieves really well. She delivers really well. She hadn't picked up birds prior to coming here. She had never had a bird shot over her before coming here. She had picked up cold game that was frozen and she had, picked up feather dummies. So she had the, she had the feel part, but she didn't have a real bird. She, you know, she, the closest she came to was a frozen bird prior to being with us. So I went, I'm trying to get her. One of the drills that we tried doing with her was quartering her out and then throwing a flyer. We threw a pigeon and we we're going to shoot it over her and let her pick that and make the retrieve. And there was way too many steps there. And she just kind of froze with it and decided I'm going to go back to what I know best. And she came right into heel position and said, I'll stay by you. That was the that was the the session in a in a nutshell, and I was frustrated with it. And the birds weren't flying the way we wanted them to fly. And Ben didn't have the gun loaded, and he, the one chance he could have shot, he didn't have a shell. And so all these things started to compound poorly in this session right before our break. And I went, "This sucks. I'm pissed. It's not going good. The dog's shutting down." So I looked at that session and I broke it down and I said, "I tried to do like six or seven things." I tried to get all of them to line up and match perfectly and thinking because I've done that before with dogs and it's worked. Well, this dog just didn't have all those pieces yet. So I said, let's do. So then I said, when we went back into it, I said, let's just do what we know she does well. I let her sit. I let her heel by my side and stand I didn't make her sit. I just had her stand by my side and I had been very controlled to take a pigeon, throw it out and shoot it. like. We weren't moving. I didn't ask her to quarter. We took it and broke it down to something she does really well. We did that with dummies forever. Now, before that, back up from that, before I even did that, I took a fresh killed bird. Actually, I took an old frozen bird and thawed it out. So it was movable. You know, I broke it down into steps. I made it so it was flexible. The wings were movable. She could pick it up by the wings if she wanted to. So normally I use that cold game to make sure she gets a good body hold on it. This time I thought it out. Had her, we made some simple retrieves with that and got her. She was hesitant to begin with because it feels funny to her. So then we did that for a little while, a couple sessions. Then we took a fresh killed bird that was warm. It was dead, but it was warm. She had to pick that up. That took a little while for did a couple sessions of that. Then we shot one. Then fast forward a couple sessions. Then we take a pigeon and we throw it out, shoot it. She runs out and 
she, she didn't mark it. She didn't see it go. She'd never seen that before. So I called her back. I get her downwind. I lined her, sent it, picked it up. She finally did that. Then we did it with a hen pheasant. So in the over like a 10 day period, we probably did six or seven sessions with slow baby steps of getting to a bird. And then we shot a bird over her. And then we shot a couple more birds over her. And then we did this over a couple of weeks. Couple more birds, all from the pocket, all where she felt comfortable, all to, to the point where she was picking up a bird that was flapping its wings and still alive. She grabbed it, brought it back to me. All the whole while, I watched her develop confidence. Then we took it and I tucked a bird in and I let her just bump into it. Well, the damn bird didn't fly. Bird ran off. She turned around and came back to me. And I went, no problem. I mean, I could have been very upset about that. In the past, I would have been very upset about it. My blood pressure went up for a second. I went, you know what? She bumped a bird. That's good. We're one step closer. She's not, does not have the desire to go catch that bird. So we did that a couple times. Thankfully, one of the birds that she bumped flew and I shot it. Like it did, she didn't really flush it. She just bumped into it and it flew the way I wanted it to. And I shot it and she stopped and she looked to me just like she always does. And I stop him on the whistle. I, I flush a bird. I stop him on the whistle. We shoot it or we let it go and then we keep moving. Well, that she stopped, bird went down. I said, go back. She went back, picked it up, brought it back to me. And that was the light bulb moment where she went, oh, I don't have to be right next to you and I can still go get it and bring it back. So then we built on that. And so we slowly took these steps. Well, all of a sudden now we go down to Iowa and they're wild birds and they're, they're way better for training. I hate, I hate, I love pen birds, but I don't like them in a lot of situations. Those situations where they run off and they're not afraid of the dog, I don't like them for that. The idea of them, the wild bird flushing, that was pretty good for her. She got her nose into it and she really wasn't even the one that flushed it. I had another dog with. That dog got in on it, flushed it, and she saw it go up and she went, cool, just kept moving. But she wasn't next to me at that point. And so we we concentrated four days of like intense amounts of just, just go and run around. Just go and run around. We're not, I'm not asking you to be with me the whole time. But we had to, we, it took a long time to get to that point. That trip, a light bulb clicked with her where she went, I'm okay with getting out. Part of it had to do with there's five other dogs. And so she built some confidence with that. And so then when we brought her home, I told the guys about it. I said, well, let's, let's go do another session. And the other day I, 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 we, again, it took steps and this is all a YouTube series, but the last session that we filmed with her, I tucked three roosters in. And roosters are a big difference from hens. Like they're, they're wasted. Go pick one up and hold on to it. And that sucker will scratch and claw and fight you. And the hens just kind of lay there like a, like a canary. I mean, they, they're totally different animals. So I took three roosters and I planted them, uh, left them for an hour. And then we went out and I worked her and worked her and worked her. And we started out with that session and she was in my pocket again. And then finally I, I, I wouldn't take her by the birds when she was in my pocket. So we just worked the cover. I got good training grounds around her. So worked the cover, worked the cover, and she got out, and she got out, and she got out. And all of a sudden, it was kind of like we were shed hunting again. She didn't know it, but that's what it kind of felt like to her. And as we worked through and as she got out and, range, and ranged a little bit, then I started to make my way to the birds. And I got downwind, and I worked my way into that pocket of cover, and I knew those birds weren't going to come out of there. And she got in there. She got birdie. She flushed one. I shot it. She retrieved it. It was beautiful. Got in on the second, beautiful. Third one, third one wouldn't fly. She had a stare down with it, but she wouldn't leave it either. She stuck with it. And finally, I walked up and spooked it and it got up. I shot it. She retrieved it. I told, I looked at Ben and I said, there, now there's a session. It was super simple. It was not complicated. It was not the finished product, but it was what I tried to do three or four weeks prior. I just put a bunch of steps in between it. And by God, she did much better. Now we're not done. We got a long ways to go. But but I just told a story about three or four weeks that was very frustrating and two week window where we basically took a break. I just gave you a micro vision of that first year of training. Like it can be very frustrating and then you just take a break and it can be slow baby steps and eventually you get where you want to get. So I, that's a that's a perfect example of like the the big picture with a dog that's just a little short window into it and the big picture is made up of lots of little windows of that similar process baby steps forward baby steps forward buddy i love it um where can everybody find you out there uh what's your youtube channel podcast writing all that stuff 
everything you can find dog bone hunter so it's at dog bone hunter um it's the the podcast is the dog bone podcast p-a-w-d-c-a-s-t probably a terrible decision to do that but uh you can search if you search dog bone or dog bone hunter it'll come up um but yeah dog bone uh it, it i our our hope is really to try to share as much stuff as we can that brings value to those that are interested in, in training their own dogs. Um, I, I certainly, I get, I get tons of feedback and I, and I appreciate it greatly, like good and bad, like I said before, but like questions, it's a great, all those platforms have ways to reach out and I'd be happy to help anyone if I can. Um, it takes me a little while, like these days, especially, it takes me a little while to get back. So I always tell people, well, that's your first test in patience. If you can't get past that, you're in trouble. Uh, but it, it, it's, um, I love the ability to be able to interact with people like, like doing your podcast. I, I, I enjoy doing this so much. I appreciate you having me on. Um, I, I look forward to doing them again. I hope we we're able to, and, and, and it's something that we've talked about and I'm all for it, man. Awesome. Well, thanks buddy. You bet. Thank you.